I know you. You're a restless audiophile. You buy a pair of speakers, keep them a year, sell them, get another pair of speakers, buy an amp, turntable, cartridge, keep, you buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell. You're stuck in this syndrome of selling stuff to get the next thing. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> you're absolutely, if you're buying it new, I should say, if you're buying new stuff, even if you get a good deal, if you're buying new stuff and then selling it six months, a year, two years later and taking a loss, you're doing it wrong. You just start because what you should be doing is buying used gear or vintage gear. Basically, the, 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 the idea here is super simple. You're going to buy a pair of five-year-old speakers, Martin Logan's, for 1500 bucks. Keep them a year. Sell them. Get most of your $1,500 back, assuming you, you chose wisely in the first place. So you can be a flipper. You can buy, sell all sorts of components and not take a bath every time you, you change your mind and say, oh, no, I got to get the blah, blah, blah. So if you're in that mode, now some people buy stuff and just keep it forever. And then in that case, you're good. Buy the best you can. I recommend actually buying new and settling in for the long haul. That makes sense. But if you're the kind, and I relate to this totally, if you're the kind that wants to try different things, you want to live with tube amplifiers, live, want to live with solid state, you want to try out vinyl and then maybe digital, if you're vacillating between different types, kinds of gear, take my advice. Stop buying new things and really look at the used market slash vintage market. So to make this video, I called up my pal, Fernando. He has a place called Sky-Fi Audio. I will link to it below. We chatted for a while. He gave me a lot of good ideas. And uh, a lot of what I'm going to say here is based on my conversation with Fernando. So thanks, Fernando. So one of the things we talked about is, well, there's a lot of stuff here, a lot, of, lot to cover. The first thing is, if you're buying an obscure brand, something really esoteric that only four people know about, it's going to be really hard to unload. So you're going to take a bath on that. So try to stick with more mainstream known companies, brands, right? And before you buy anything used, look around. See if they're selling on eBay, on Audiogon, in different places. See if there's actually a market for this thing that you're going to lay down your hard-earned cash for. So before you buy, <laughs> thinking about sell, selling this thing that you're about to buy and how easy that's going to be. Now, we couldn't, Fernando and I couldn't really have this conversation and not mention Macintosh. Macintosh is one of those companies that's been around for, <laughs> since the 40s and they have brand loyalty. So you're going to pay a little more to get Mac but when you sell it, you're going to get a lot of your money back, assuming you chose wisely. Um, so Mac stuff has great resale value. And as long as you have, for Mac or anything else, Fernando has made a really good point about this I wasn't thinking about, you got to have the original factory packaging box, all the stuff that goes inside the foam and stuff inside the box to reliably ship any kind of audio products, uh, any distance. So if you're selling it to someone who's going to put it, you know, in their car on the front seat or something, yeah, then packaging is not required. But if you ever want to sell something, you really need the original packaging, and it should be packaging that's in good shape, not falling apart, so that it can withstand being dropped by UPS or FedEx or something a couple of times. Uh, if you don't have the original packaging and you ship something and it's damaged, you're basically screwed. It's going to be really hard to collect on insurance if the packaging isn't up to snuff. They will definitely nail you on that. So, <laughs> you know, don't mess around with that. Product category that's tough to do uh, is uh, turntables because turntables are really fragile. Uh, difficult to ship and even if you have the original packaging unless you really know your stuff on how to pack it the chances of it surviving are not the best so and in, in other words in terms of you buying something vintage uh, and uh, it arriving safely 
unless the seller really knows what they're doing, if they're a professional dealer that's used to packing these things or you're, you're dealing with an audiophile who's very, very experienced, sure, it'll probably be okay. But otherwise, it can be a big risk. And if you have it and you don't have that packaging and you're trying to sell it and you can't, you can't really pack it with, uh, with expertise, the chances of when you ship it to the next person, it's surviving is kind of iffy. So turntables are harder than pretty much any other category. And of course, buying a used expensive cartridge like a Koetsu or a Lyra, well, <laughs> that's full of risk. Except, except, and I knew this from personal experience, if you sell a cartridge or buy a cartridge, it's already claimed by the owner to be damaged. But it's an expensive cartridge, like a $2,000 Koetsu, and the cantilever is broken or something. Well, then you're going to just get it re-tipped. So the condition of the cartridge itself is not that big a deal. But you're going to pay a lot less to buy a damaged cartridge and then pay again to have it re-tipped. And believe me, I've done that. I've sold uh, broken cartridges or I've sold cartridges that I said were not in tip-top shape. So I took a lower price. But I was a fair seller. So then we mulled over the tube versus solid state electronics question. Well, I was a little surprised by Fernando's answer because he said tubes win. So if you want vintage solid state gear that doesn't hold its value as well, you're going to pay less for it. So that's cool, right? Um, and obviously there's a little, I'd say there's an advantage in terms of reliability of solid state. Tube, on the other hand, well, you're going to pay a little more, but there's a bigger market for, t for used slash vintage gear. So again, brands matter. I would not get too far off the mainstream when you're making these choices. Um, what, one area of the conversation we, we circled around to was uh, the, the idea of when you're buying vintage, older stuff, what about the capacitors? Do they age? Are they going to have to be replaced? Or should they have already been replaced before you buy it? And from a guy who's buying and selling gear all the time, <laughs> Fernando's answer really surprised me. He said this whole thing with having to replace caps and older stuff is overrated. Like, sure, if it's really old and it's not in good condition, yeah, you're going to need to replace the caps. He said, but depending on the brand and the conditions and how it was used, you might not have to replace the caps. He said they check every piece of gear that runs through SkyFi and they look at it and if, they, if the caps, if the original caps are in good condition, they're not going to change the caps, right? So. Don't be overly crazy about requiring that the caps have to be changed. He did point out something interesting. We circled around to digital. He said, first of all, DAX, used DAX, vintage DAX, are, don't hold their value, right? So uh, if you want to uh, you know, get a two or three year old DAC that's relatively current, that would be good and you'll probably have big savings because you're buying a used DAC. But if you're buying a 10 year old DAC or 15 year old DAC, well, they're going to be so far out of what's happening now that you'll get them for a really good price, you know, and they probably still sound good. But he said transports, actually CD transports, do uh, hold their value better because transport technology hasn't changed that much from decade to decade. So getting a decent transport is a good thing to do and not be overly concerned about flipping it. He said Sony, early Sony SACD players, the ones that are built like tanks, those are really highly sought after because, first of all, they're freaking gorgeous. They do sound good. Sony put a lot of engineering muscle behind those early SACD players, um, so they're highly sought after. And we talked about vintage receivers, you know, 70s and 80s receivers, stereo receivers by Pioneer and Onkyo and et cetera, et cetera. And those, first of all, look really cool. And some people are buying them just because they look cool and put them in a bedroom system, you know, or in a bed den or something. Not as a primary component, but just for that. So they're actually, their value is pretty steady. So again, buying and selling vintage uh, receivers in good condition from name brands is a good way to go in terms of flipping. That's what the subject of this video today is. It's about having an interesting audio file life without costing you a lot of money over the long term. Because if you're buying and selling gear for close to the same price, you, you, you buy a, a vintage Pioneer receiver for 800 bucks, keep it two years, sell it for $700, 
you've owned something really beautiful for a hundred bucks. That's that's really cool and a nice way to do it. Another thing I learned is that a lot of audio files are old. Well, I didn't learn that. I already knew that. But they don't like really heavy gear, and I relate. So the the market for people selling, you know, 100 watt Krells and Mark Levinsons and stuff that are 100 pounds, 80 pounds, uh, unless you're selling it to someone younger who doesn't mind moving around heavy things, isn't so great. So you can get great deals on big monster solid state amplifiers or tube amplifiers for that matter because we're talking now about the weight of them so that's really interesting so basically what we're saying here is that low power but light lighter in weight amplifiers hold their value better than big heavy high powered amplifiers i didn't see that one coming but it makes perfect sense in other words there are deals to be had in expensive formerly very expensive high powered and very heavy uh, amplifier. So that's what you're lusting after. Jump right in. Finishing up here, I would say buying anything used, cars or audio or boats or anything, there's a certain amount of risk. You're taking a chance. Now that can be minimized by buying from a, a dealer or a company that backs up their used products with some sort of warranty, but you're going to pay more for that. We're buying from an independent seller who has a good track record as a seller. Uh, and beyond that, hey man, you're on your own. <laughs> so my name is Steve Guttenberg. This is the Audiophiliac Daily Show. And it's coming up daily. We're closing in, and it is a week. We are closing in on 100,000 subscribers here. So if you haven't yet subscribed, jump on board. Hit that button down there. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Audiophiliac Man. You can follow me on Instagram at Steve.Guttenberg. What else? Oh, you can check out my Patreon page at P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Audiophiliac. And as we're rounding out the new year, have a great one, and I hope 2020 is even better. And as always, thank you so much for watching.